Hello everyone, I hope you're all keeping well, healthy and happy. In this video I'm going to talk about the cycles that mythological arcs go through. Okay, all mythological arcs have cycles, right? And I'll tell you what they are. You first have the Genesis arc, okay, which is the It's a story that's told to you about yourself, okay? It's a story that's told to you about human civilization, how you got here, what you are, who you are, and where you're going, which is what the Genesis story fundamentally does. You then have the conflict that takes place within the story, okay? Okay? And within the conflict period, usually in the story, you have some sort of uh, protagonist and an antagonist set up in the story, right? An example of this could be Cain and Abel, or Moses and Pharaoh, or in the Egyptian uh, mythos, you would have Horus and Set, okay? Okay. So every story goes in this fashion, if you will. Every story presents this, this sort of conflict. Then you have the resolution to that conflict in which the antagonist fails and the protagonist wins. Okay, In some way, shape or form, they've overcome the battles. They've overcome the hardships and survived. And go on to thrive also. Okay? Then the story arc reaches a zenith. Okay? I.e. it becomes accepted. And the wisdom of it is accepted by peoples. Right? Then follow four very interesting other phenomenon and these are the deconstruction phases of that mythology okay because what happens is once the mythos has reached its zenith then people begin to question it after its power wanes and the power wanes because people are tired of hearing the story it's the same story if, if, if all you hear is the same story. If you were, for example, just given one newspaper to read for your whole life, you would very quickly get tired of that newspaper. Okay, you'd very quickly get tired of it because there's no new stories. Novelty is something that we respond to very well as consumerism has shown. Okay? So, if the story becomes stale, if there's nothing new that's done with the story, what happens is that people begin to want to deconstruct the story. And this starts out in the form of burlesque. And I don't mean the burlesque dancing, okay, although maybe it does, I don't know, right? But in the original sense, burlesque means the humorous side of it. Right, the parodies that are made of the mythos, the ridiculing of its ideas, send-ups, right? So people begin to ridicule the mythos. Just lightly, okay? They're not prodding it and being horrific, although sometimes it can advance into that as well. But typically, it's just poking fun at the mythos itself. Then what happens is, that, again, the central story begins to lose its power more and more, and people become nostalgic for the original story, because it spoke to something within them. Okay? And so, people try, within that community or within that society, people try and 
retell that story, okay? But they're usually not very good at it because they can't remember why that story was originally created, why the mythos was originally created, okay? And so, again, it keeps losing its power. Then you get the demythologization phase, which is really interesting. Because what happens in that phase is that the parts of it that are actually the most important are rejected. The parts of the story that speak to us most directly about our being about the nature of existence, about what we are doing here, what we are supposed to do, all of those are removed in an attempt to adhere to the story more literally, okay? i.e. the priest classes or the storytellers, because the priest classes were the storytellers originally, the storytellers start creating a literalist interpretation of that story. Okay? And so what happens is all the best parts are removed out of it. All the fun parts, the ones that speak to us about who we are, the bits of it that are numinous, that push us to do great things... All of those are taken out of it. Now it's just a literalist interpretation of said story. Right? And the mythos yet again loses power because the power was never in the literal interpretation of the stories. It was always in the abstract. See, the abstract, the creative, the imaginal realm is far more powerful because that's what birthed the story in the first place. And it must have birthed it for a reason. Why do I say that? Well, because evidently we recognize something in the story that contained something which resembled truth. Otherwise, mythologies just die off. Okay, they don't persevere through the ages. They're not preserved through the ages. Okay? They're just left by the wayside if they don't talk to us. Look at all the crap, terrible novels that are written, written. If you consider how many books are written and how many books people actually read. I'm talking about fictional books here specifically, right? Most, most fiction is crap. It doesn't speak to us. So we just throw it away. And the same thing's true of movies, right? Most movies don't speak to us. Thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of movies have been made worldwide. And how many do we ever actually really hear about that really resonate with the human spirit, with the human condition? So it's no different for ancient mythologies either. Okay? But once they become literalist, they've lost their power. Completely and wholly. That's it, dead. The, that mythos is now dead after it's been converted into a static state of a literal interpretation. Then what you get is reaffirmation. Which is again another interesting little phenomenon which occurs. Because at the reaffirmation stage... People begin to reaffirm the old ancient mythos. The very thing which created the mythos. The reasons why it came about. The essence of the story, you might call it. Right? The essence of the story is resurrected. If you want to think about it in this fashion, every story or mythological arc goes through a birth, a death, and a rebirth. Okay? If it's a good story. If it's a terrible story, people just won't pay attention to it. Right? And see all these stages that I've spoken about. You can see these in Christianity, 
For example, you can see it and it becomes especially obvious with Islam with the absolute de facto definitive literalist interpretation of everything in the book. That's been the case since Ibn Taymiyyah in the 13th century, I think it was, reinterpreted all the uh, Islamic scriptures and literature. Okay? Birthing what later became Wahhabism, because Wahhab just adopted his ideas, you see, and... Uh, Anyway, the point is, because I don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to talk about Islam too much here, because I've already addressed it elsewhere. Uh, but you can see it in Christianity, you can see it in Islam, uh, you can see it also in Judaism as well. Okay, why is it that you've got so many reformist Jews today? Because the ancient texts, the the origin stories. And the essence of what they were saying before they later became corrupted and changed and everything else, the essence of them was exactly the same as the mythos that originated in ancient Egypt. And the ancient Egyptian mythos was exactly the same as the Babylonian. They just wrote them in as new characters, basically, and they changed the stories a little bit, right? But fundamentally, it's the same story being thro being told through the ages. Okay? So, you can see this play out with what we'd, we would today call ideologies. What's an ideology? What's the difference between a mythos, a mythology, and an ideology? If you don't know that already. Well, the mythos is the story, it's the creative essence, it's the generative principle, it is the um, abstract, okay? But the ideology is what happens, an ideology comes about after all the creative juices are taken out of it, are extracted from the original mythos, and you're left with something archaic and dead, that's what an ideology is. It's something archaic and dead. There is nothing in it that is of any use to you. There is nothing in it that speaks to you. Okay? What's my point with this? My point with this is that we have to be very, very careful when it comes to putting all mythologies in the same basket. Okay, because they're not. All of them are at different stages in their evolution. And all of them are going through these various stages of either being created, dying, or resurrecting themselves. That's what's really going on in the world right now. When it comes to all these forms of ideological possession, for example, even with things like communism or socialism, which purport to be atheistic, but they're not, because they're built upon a belief system. They have their own gods and their own demons. They demonize anyone that does not agree with the central ideological belief. It's no different from Islamism. It's no different from what Islam has become. It's no different from the absolute extreme versions of Christianity. And you can see some of these extreme versions. I'm not talking about the Christianity that's practiced in, with the true essence kept in mind, with Christ consciousness at its center. Okay, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the type of Christianity in which people become eschatological and nihilistic. Those people, by the way, are no different from the Islamists. There's far fewer of them, though. There is far, There are far fewer of them. 
The reason for that is because every so often, this is something I've noticed, and you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but every so often in Christianity what happens is someone comes along that does reignite the passion, the energy, the creative essence of what the original stories meant. Okay, and people in Christian communities tend to do that a lot more, which keeps the essence alive. It keeps the creative abstract juices, it keeps them flowing within us. Okay, it keeps them fresh. But if that goes, if the myth is deconstructed completely and um, you get this demythologization and the best aspects of it are all taken out, and it becomes a dead, archaic, um, literal interpretation of what is fundamentally an ideology, then at that point, I'm sorry, but but uh, you you have lost your way. Okay, and of course there are new mythologies that are popping up as well. There's new belief systems of all kinds of strange things, and right now people aren't being too critical of them because. They're new. But perhaps they might be the most insidious and dangerous, like all this New Age garbage, which was started off by Barbara Marx Hubbard. Very, very dangerous person. She started off the New Age movement, if you don't already know that. And it was very, very closely aligned to and tied to the Soviet state in Russia, the communist Soviet state of Russia. Okay? It is... Here's the funny thing about the New Age movement. It is inextricably linked to communism. It's just that people don't know that because it's covered in some very, very strange language, which makes it seem ethereal and hippie-like. But in actual point of fact, it's probably among the most subjectivist, nihilistic nonsense being peddled out there. Okay, and it's destroying people's lives. But getting back on point here, because we're veering off a little bit, I think, right? Getting back on point, these mythological arcs go through these cycles. And if, the, if they're not constantly reinvigorated, then you're running the risk of turning it into an archaic dead thing which leads to the collapse and the death of civilizations. And the other thing I would say very quickly, finally, in closing, is that although we've been talking a great deal about the mythologies which exist uh, in terms of um, these uh, group belief systems, there are also certain mythologies, mythos, that we tell ourselves. Okay, we hold certain beliefs about things which are at times delusional. And at times they're true. So we have personal mythos. We have a personal story that we tell ourselves about all kinds of things. For example, you tell yourself that your spouse loves you, that your wife or husband loves you. What happens when that mythos is deconstructed? Well, people end up... Uh, going into a place of absolute chaos in their lives, right? They don't know how to deal with that many a time. But it, it can oftentimes turn out that that belief was erroneous. Okay? We can lie to ourselves about all kinds of things. We tell ourselves these stories. The best stories that survive, though, are the ones that are true. So, if you're telling yourself that your spouse loves you, and they do, those are the best kind of stories. They bring us a great deal of happiness. Same thing with um, other types of stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, even. Right? Muhammad Ali had this thing, I am the greatest. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Right? 
That's a mythos. It's a mythos that won him many great fights. So mythological arcs are important. And we deconstruct them at our peril, in a sense, as well. Because if there's nothing to replace it with, that's where we're running the real dangers, I think. And this is part of the risk with what's going on in Western civilization. And perhaps civilizations go through these phases as well. You know? But what keeps that civilization refreshed is the central mythos, the creative juices which run through that society. And when I talk about creative, being creative, or the creative juices, what I'm talking about is creation itself. To create. Okay, I'm not talking about creative in the sense that it's understood today. Okay, I'm talking about the generative principle. The numinous part of ourselves that continues to nurture the very best of who we are. That strengthens it, that replenishes it. Okay? And actually, that's where all real creativity comes from. But that's a talk for another time, I guess. Uh, main, the main thing here is just to know what these cycles are, uh, which happen with any mythological arc, as I see. And we're seeing a lot of these things play out in the world at large. We are seeing that happen. It's happening in the Islamic world as well. You know, um, people are taking on literalist interpretations of all kinds of things. And what they don't realize is that their own, the essence of their own mythos, well, they've destroyed it in favor of literalism. And it brings about nothing but violence and anger and hatred and killing, mass killing, lots and lots of killing, which always tends to accompany nihilism because they're believing in an old, archaic, dead thing. You see? Anyway, um, I hope that's been informative in some sense for you. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I always, always, always value every single one of you, all my viewers, all my subscribers. Uh, you really do mean a great deal to me and to this channel as well. So thank you again from, from the bottom of my heart. God bless you all. Take good care of yourselves and bye-bye.